This week's number, 25. That's how many pounds of avocados Chipotle's new avocado machine can peel and core. The machine will cut the amount of time it takes to make Chipotle's guac in half from 50 minutes to 25 minutes. No joke, my local Chipotle is organizing a stand-up comedy night. I'm going for shits and giggles. Welcome to Property Markets. Today, we're discussing Carvana and corporate governance and Microsoft's latest AI announcements. Here with the news is Property Media Analyst Ed Elson. Ed, what is the good word? I'm excited for my vacation, Scott. T minus four days now. Another vacation? Where are First you going? One, man. What? Jesus, how much vacation? <laughs> <laughs> Literally, your life is vacation <laughs> interrupted by fits of work. Where no, are you going? No, I, I'm going to Mykonos. Oh, you're going. Oh, we talked that's about right, this. That's right. That's yeah. You're gonna. It's a ton of fun. That's a long way for you. Yeah, it's worth it. Yeah, that's great. And, you, there and for, you're going with buddies. Mm-hmm. Going with uh, five of my mates. Same squad. Did the same thing last year. I, it's we're just running the whole thing back. I can't wait. So six. Six young men rolling into a club <laughs> in in Mykonos. There's a word for that. No. <laughs> There's a word. I'm a sorry. Recipe I am for success. Sorry. If I could do a Greek accent, I'd do it. But I <laughs> hope you have reservations. And um, anyways, uh, you're gonna you're gonna have a great time. Spend a bunch of time on a boat. Yeah. That's that's right. Uh, good for you. All right, take us to the headlines. You Greek partying. <laughs> By the way, I, I, I can't believe, Ed, your life is so much different. Like, you, you know what was a big, big night for me was Magic Mountain. You go to Mykonos, I went to Magic Mountain <laughs> when I was your age. Times yeah, have changed. Yeah. Anyways, go ahead. Senators Kirsten Gillibrand and Josh Hawley introduced a bipartisan bill to ban federal government officials from owning and trading individual stocks. The ban would apply to senior members of the legislative and executive branches, as well as their immediate family. A U.S. district judge ruled that cryptocurrency company Ripple did not violate securities law when it sold its XRP token on public exchanges. Cryptocurrency prices rose significantly on that news. Netflix added 6 million subscribers in the second quarter, triple what analysts expected. That's thanks to the company's crackdown on password sharing and its new ad-supported tier. Still, revenue came in weaker than expected and the stock fell 9%. Goldman Sachs reported that profits fell 58% year over year in the second quarter. That's its worst quarterly profit drop since 2020 at the start of the pandemic. And finally, beauty AI company Oddity made its public debut. And as predicted on our show last week, the shares got a pop. The stock rose more than 35%. That's on top of the fact that they were repriced higher before the IPO. Scott, reactions? Uh, so let's start with uh, a bipartisan bill to ban federal government officials from owning and trading individual stocks. It is insane <laughs> that this isn't already a law. Yeah. I mean, essentially, there's a, a massive amount of research that the majority of these representatives and congresspeople are privy to that basically says one thing. And the, 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 the chairman of the Fed, Treasury Secretary, we all tell them the same thing. To believe you can beat the market is irrational, dumb, illusory, what have Mm -hmm. you. And I believe the majority of them know that, except, except, unless, unless you have inside information. Mm -hmm. The fact that these guys go into private hearings, security, national security hearings with defense contractors, and these people get to decide the budgets, right, of a $700 billion, this is just one sector, in military spending, and they know before anybody who's having their spending increased, who's getting spending cut, if Northrop's about to get a contract for four more Trident-class submarines, which will take revenues up $30 billion, and then they can go trade on those stocks. And there's some, there's some guidelines right now saying if you do it, it's bad, no, no, but they pay a small fee. Yep. And what do you know? The Speaker of the House, um, or former Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, her and her husband, have just a remarkable track record of picking stocks. And this is not only just incredibly wrong, it, it attacks people's belief and faith in the markets. And our robust markets, where there is a decent 
association with rule of fair play are the result that American companies can raise more capital than companies in other countries. It's the reason why Americans who, when they retire, hopefully have some financial security because our markets tend to go up and to the right. And when we let our elected representatives who have access to insider information trade stocks, it's just it, – it literally cements the notion that they are doing something the rest of us can't do. Mm-hmm. And any representative who fights this legislation is saying, I want to continue to trade on insider information mm-hmm. because it shouldn't matter – that they only get to invest in mutual funds. It shouldn't matter yeah. unless they believe they can beat the market, which means one of two things. They're stupid or they acknowledge they have access to insider information. So this is, this is overdue. Having worked at Morgan Stanley and now working a lot with Goldman Sachs and different investment banks, very few of them are ever allowed to trade stocks. Mm-hmm. David Solomon and Jamie Dimon do not trade stocks yet yep. just for that reason. And they, have ac- they know it. They're, they're contaminated. The moment... When I'm on a call with someone on a board, they, if, they, you know, they, they, if they say you're about to get inside information, it means you are no longer allowed to trade in, in those stocks. Okay. And I can bet you that – and when they do, and there's examples of it, my, one of my stallmates, Morgan Stanley, went to prison mm-hmm. for insider trading. He was feeding information to like his cousin in Singapore, and this is the late 80s. So the, I'd be shocked anywhere, anywhere if you sign up to be an analyst in the M&A group of an investment bank that you are – ever allowed to buy and sell a stock. You can go into blind trust. You can go into ETFs. So right now, there are fewer restrictions on elected representatives who have access to more insider information than anyone in an investment bank. Mm-hmm. And the people at investment banks, if you're working on a deal, the fastest blue line path to prison would be to trade on insider information. And that's true of the law firms. That's true of the PR firms helping them with comms. You get a talking to saying you are now privy to non-public mater- material, non-public information, and you can go to jail if you trade on this information. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't think it's happening there. Yeah. And when it does, they're taking an enormous risk. These individuals, they just don't have a leg to stand on. And the notion that we should try and figure out when they're when they've engaged in insider trading and put them in jail, this should just be legislation. You have access to massive amounts of material non-public information. You should not be able to trade stocks. And by the way, that shouldn't be a big deal. You can still participate in capitalism. You can invest in mutual funds and ETFs and index funds, which by the way, we believe is the right way to go anyways. Mm -hmm. So, But the notion they can trade individual stocks is just insane. And Speaker Pelosi, quite frankly, is kind of the poster child for just how, quite frankly, how corrupt this is. This is overdue. And anyone who raises their hand and tries to get in the way of this is saying, no, I like insider trading and I want to keep doing it. Let's talk about the U.S. district judge that ruled a cryptocurrency company, Ripple, did not violate securities law. And we saw, I think we've seen Ripple just rip up. Yep. I know that Coinbase, I think, has doubled in the last couple of months. And Jason Stavers, our editor-in-chief, reminded us that it almost means nothing. And it's really interesting because we have a tendency, whenever we hear a judge is ruled, that's the headline. That's the news alert from CNN. Well, the reason that they shouldn't be celebrating is because if you look at the ruling, the ruling just doesn't make any sense. Basically, according to the judge, half of those XRP tokens that were sold were securities and the other half weren't. And the ones that weren't securities are apparently the ones that were sold to retail investors on crypto exchanges. And strangely, the ones that were securities, i.e. the ones that should have securities regulations and disclosures, are the ones that were sold to institutional investors, i.e. the people who need regulations the least. So it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, they're basically saying, okay, you're an experienced investor, you're a VC, we're going to give you the protections that you need so that you can validate, yes, this is a security. Or if you're just some kid who heard about the XRP token on, say, Reddit, then it's not a security, there's no regulation, there are no protections, just throw your money at the wall and see what happens. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I think, like, I think you're right, um, and, and we should save that for our prediction because I think there's some real insight here. Let's move on. Yep. Goldman reported profits fell 58% year on year. This is some of the exit costs of getting out of the consumer business. Um, their, trading volume, their trading volume is down, uh, deal-making is down. In some, uh, 
Goldman is, they're great at trading, but they're primarily known as the premier deal makers. And so when IPOs and M&A is down, their earnings are going to get hit hard. After reading the earnings announcement, you announced it as a kitchen sink quarter where they kind of took a very conservative accounting approach and threw a lot of losses at this quarter to try and get it all out. Yeah. And that appears to have worked. I think the stock's actually up today. Um, so, But it is its worst quarterly profit drop since 2020. Uh, but they've kind of thrown stuffed everything into this quarter. And a lot of this is more, I would argue, more cyclical than basically. I mean, there's some there's some things here management has to take responsibility for, specifically the, what looks like an expensive foray into the consumer world. So that's the bad news. The good news is they're smart enough to get out. Um, the the other stuff that is really sort of outside of their control is just what is a, a cyclical decline in deal making where they get a lot of fees. Um, in terms of uh, AI company Oddity, we made this prediction, and it was an easy prediction. There's just very few good companies in the shoot here. And Oddity is kind of this rare company, and I want to be clear, I bought stock in the IPO yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, there's very few companies in the shoot who are growing 30, 40, 60 percent a year and also profitable. And they're leveraging technology and AI to match the perfect skin tone using something called spectral photography and AI. Okay. And I think that creates a feeling of security and barriers of exit around going to another foundation. They launched this other brand called Spoiled Child, and they're very good at moving people down the funnel of being just a browser on their website to doing a ton of A-B testing, using machine learning to get them to convert at higher rates. Really strong margins, but there just aren't that many companies we've seen go public that have managed to thread the needle of growth and profitability at the same time. And the stock was up, I believe it was up 40% um, on its IPO on its on its first trade. And I think today, the day after, I thought it would check back a little bit. It's not. It's up another. Um, it's up another eight mm. percent. So, you're going to see. Um, a, it's it feels like it's a great company, and there aren't that many lined up. And because there's a lag between when you decide to go public and getting public, um, a lot of this is not their fault in the sense that there's just so much appetite and money on the sidelines ready for a good company, and there just aren't that many queued up on stage, if you will. So anyways, uh, it was an easy prediction, but we got that prediction right. Is, are you viewing that as sort of a momentum trade or a long-term investment? Because a lot of what you said around the combination of beauty and technology and the leveraging AI, and it's one of the first big consumer IPOs. Um, that that sounds sort of momentum based. Are you going to hold for a while? Well, is it a trade or is it a hold? Yeah. Right. So, um, it's it's not what I call fully valued right now. But whenever you buy a stock and you could recognize a forty five percent gain in twenty four hours, there's a reasonable temptation to sell and just take the gain, or at least maybe take some off the table. I think I'm a holder here because I think I'm super excited. They're about to launch or going to launch in 2025 an acne brand. And I think if you look at the ability to absorb with machine learning several million photographs and figure out the right treatment, I just, mm -hmm. to me, that sounds really powerful. And when I look at the beauty industry, there really aren't what I'd call a lot of hot growth brands right now. Le Maquillage is a really strong brand. It's a strong company. They just got raised a shit ton of capital. They could probably go buy some small beauty-related tech startups. And I think the momentum here is going to take the stock higher. I think mm -hmm. this is a company that could be a $10 billion market cap beauty brand and be a reasonable, not a competitor, but a threat to L'Oreal and Estee Lauder who trade at much larger market cap. So I'm probably a holder here. If it were to like double in the next 30 days, I might think about taking my initial investment off the table mm -hmm. and playing with the house's money. Yep. What one mistake I make, but I continue to make it, is I always, almost always hold a stock for longer than a year because it just pains me to pay short-term capital gains on a trade. Yep. And quite frankly, sometimes that doesn't work out. Letting the tax tail wag the dog is not a good idea, but I can't help it because if I'm in something six or seven months, I just can't help but think, well, if I just hold on another five, I get a 10% pop in the stock price because I'm going to pay 22.8 as opposed to 37. And then there, there are ways to kind of, I don't want to say short it, but limit your upside, but reduce the downside by writing calls and other things you can do. But I very rarely own a stock for less than a year. And if you talk to great investors, usually where they've had really big wins is, you know, I bought $400,000 worth of Apple stock in 2010. 
and I think it's worth eight or ten million dollars now. And any one year it did okay, and some years it was down. But holding a stock, there's nothing that creates wealth like one inheriting it. But two, if you if you're not smart enough to inherit money, two real estate. Uh, the majority of the, the, I think, if you look at the Forbes 400, a disproportionate amount of them are in real estate. But also buying a good company and holding on to it for a decade. If it can compound at 10, 12, or a company like Apple at 18%, 10 years goes by really fast and you wake up. The way you get wealthy is patience and letting time take over. And if you let time take over and you diversify, you're going to find one of your companies goes up 5, 10, 20 X. Mm-hmm. So I have a bias towards just holding on. And to be clear, it's hurt me a couple of times. I invested in the IPO of Lemonade. It went to 200. Now I think it's at 20 or 23. When it was at 200, I probably should have said, okay, as great a company as it is, this makes no sense. And I did sell down, but I didn't sell, you know, I didn't sell all of it. I still own a bunch of it because I like the management team and I like the company. But I'm generally speaking, long-winded way of saying I'm generally speaking a long-term holder. Mm-hmm. Netflix, uh, Netflix, other than TikTok, is the biggest uh, beneficiary of the rider strike. <laughs> Try and find someone who says the following. I canceled my Netflix subscription because there's less content because of the rider strike. The content pool at Netflix right now is the depth of the Mariana Trench. I could, does anybody know there's a strike on who's watching Netflix? They get, my understanding is somewhere between two thirds and 80% of their content production marches on. I think they have 10,000 people in Madrid making content. Mm -hmm. So thank you, uh, writers, um, you know, thank you, writers union, who is it? The WM, I forget, WGA said the, uh, said the uh, Economic Bureau of Spain. Thank you, says TikTok. And Netflix, just by tightening up uh, you know, password sharing, added 6 million subscribers. They're adding people. They're adding 6 million subscribers. Yeah. And this all goes back to the notion that I think Netflix is the big winner coming out of the strike. I think it's, it's, it's a dream for them. It's a gift to them. And the riders, in my opinion, in the union, and I've been saying this a lot, should absolutely partner with the studios and Netflix and go really hard at the biggest pile of money and basically say, look, we are really going to seriously get in the way of your ability to charge a subscription fee because you are crawling our content everywhere. And we represent almost every content creator in the world. And this is the moment. And I was at this moment in 2008 with the New York Times when we were so fascinated with Google that we let them crawl our data and debase our amazing content for pennies on the dollar. We should have all gotten together. The new houses, the Murdochs, the Salzburgers, you know, the people who own the FT, and said, we're going to present one unified front to Google and to Microsoft and the other search guys, and we're going to extract fair value for the fact that we are painting their house every millisecond. And that is what's happening the same moment here. The biggest pile of money is tech as it relates to AI, and that's who the WGA and SAG and AFTRA and the studios should be partnering with to go after. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about that when we get to Microsoft, but first let's move on to our first story. Shares in the troubled used car retailer Carvana soared after the company said it had reached a deal to restructure its debt. The agreement will eliminate 83% of Carvana's 2025 and 2027 unsecured note maturities, and it will reduce its total debt by more than $1.2 billion. Shares rose 43% on the announcement. Carvana also made headlines during the pandemic as its stock more than quintupled. 2022, however, was a disaster year. Inflation and rising interest rates suppressed demand for used cars, and the stock shed all of its gains, down 98% from its peak. The company was also hit with several lawsuits. One came from a couple of shareholders who alleged that the Garcia family, which controls the company, had engaged in a pump-and-dump scheme. That suit claims the family inflated sales numbers and quietly sold the stock. But the debt restructuring is promising to investors. So is their latest earnings report, which beat estimates with a $105 million net loss. The company is also issuing $350 million in new stock. And year-to-date, Carvana is up, get this, 1,000%. It's still well off its pandemic high, but these gains put the stock back at 2019 levels. Scott, Carvana was a huge name a couple of years ago. What do you think of this news? 
The markets are bipolar, and this is really speaks to what is the core competence of a great investor, and that is your ability to disassociate, specifically trying to ignore your emotions. Because when Carvana is on the way up, and it's the future, and used car prices are skyrocketing, and everybody's going to buy cars through Carvana, everybody piles into the stock and takes it to just unsustainable levels that assume that it's going to sell every car in the world. And then they have some governance problems, and governance matters. One of the reasons that our stocks and our markets trade at a higher multiple is that we do have uh, greater regulatory scrutiny, and generally speaking, we have better governance. Most boards take their role very seriously. And this transaction with his dad, it just really stank. It just really, it just didn't, you just heard about it and you thought, okay, another reason not to like this company. And investors will ignore poor corporate governance when the stock's skyrocketing. They're like, whatever, you know, I'll ignore it, all right? If you get straight A's, I don't mind that you're vaping on weekends with your friends. When you start getting B's and C's, I'm going to start paying attention to the fact that your clothes smell like nicotine. Anyways, God, that was a good analogy. I'm proud of that. I just made that up. Carvana, uh, the markets are bipolar. And then everybody just got, which is very down on Carvana, and it got hammered. And the markets are, tend to be either manic or depressed. And everything, when you look at a company or investment, has to be set against valuation. At some point, almost any stock is overvalued. NVIDIA is an amazing company in the hottest sector in the world. And guess what? Its current valuation indicates or assumes that it's going to sell every semiconductor and every GPU in the world. So it's probably overvalued. At the same time, when Caravana was trading at cash, they do sell cars. They are an important company. And they took down costs. They reduced costs. Their revenues were off 24% year on year, but their cost of sales decreased 29%. Their SG&A declines 37%. So in some, they've cut costs faster than the revenue declines, mm -hmm. which adds up to a decline in loss. Yep. And the loss did narrow from $438 million to 105. So the market looks at this company and says it's a big player. They're, they're making hard decisions that are moving them towards profitability, and it had been overpunished. When... In March of 2021, when its enterprise value to sales was 4.8, now it's 1.1. And by the way, that EV, that EV to sales ratio is about the same for Ford and GM, who are in the ugly business of manufacturing. It's actually cheaper than CarMax right now. So it's, or, or in July. So the tick up is really the notion that, okay, at some point, every company, no matter how much you love it, is a sell. And at almost and again, with almost every company at some point, it's a buy unless it's going to zero. And Carvana does feel like it has enterprise value there. So I think it's an interesting lesson in corporate governance mattering, but also just the bipolar nature of the markets and how really the core competence investing is trying and it's hard to separate yourself from your emotions. Yeah, I mean, so you bring up this idea of corporate governance and just some history on, on Carvana. So Carvana was spun out of another used car company called Drive Time. And it turns out that Drive Time is run by the founder of Carvana's dad, this guy named Ernie Garcia. Um, and just a side note, that guy Ernie Garcia was guilty of bank fraud in the 90s. But let's just ignore that for now. For now. Uh, Mia, our research lead, looked through the filings and she found some very sketchy information as it relates to Drive Time. So first off, Carvana buys cars and leases office space and sells warranties on behalf of Drive Time. And the filings don't disclose anything about whether Carvana could have gotten better prices on those services somewhere else in the market. There was also a shareholder lawsuit that alleged Carvana paid $400 million to drive time, which was at the time equivalent to a third of Carvana's gross profit. And then probably most alarmingly, there's this quote in the annual report that says, quote, the interests of the Garcia parties may not in all cases be aligned with our stockholders' interests. And all this... Meanwhile, the Garcias have basically total control of the company because they have a dual-class shareholder structure. So you mentioned the idea of the markets being bipolar. Is there a line in terms of sketchiness, uh, uh, bad fiduciary obligations, um, just the fact that they have this strange parental relationship, literally a parental relationship with drive time? Is there a line at which you're like, okay, I totally need to stay away from this company and everyone else should as well? I wouldn't invest. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a trade. It might be, it might have just gotten so cheap that you might have looked at it and said, well, it, the company isn't going away yeah. and it has more cash. At, at one point, I bet it was trading for cash. 
But here's the thing. This type of conflict, all right, selling, having a relationship with a company controlled by your father, mm -hmm. that is uncomfortable. That in and among itself, though, isn't illegal. And there are certain situations where conflict benefits the company. Maybe they were getting a sweetheart deal. Maybe it was the best type of relationship in the industry given the options. However, however, the board, what this indicates is they have a shitty board right. that doesn't understand the term fiduciary. Fiduciary is a wonderful word. It means that once you have your deal set, once you know you're getting this many options, vesting once a year for four years, and you get a certain annual fee to serve as a director, you are now doing nothing but serving other parties' interests. Mm -hmm. You are representing shareholders. You are representing the Commonwealth. You are representing uh, employees. You are representing the community. You're not supposed to be thinking about yourself. It's okay to have related party transactions as long as the special committee of the board and the company can show that this is a good relationship with market economics. Mm -hmm. That's okay. As long as you've done the work and said, this is a great relationship, we benefit from the personal relationship, and the services we are buying from them and the money we are paying are market rates. That's fine. It doesn't appear they've done that here. So this thing stinks. That's not to say it won't go up another 1,000% or then down 90%, mm -hmm. but in general, as someone who likes to think of themselves not as a corporate governance expert, but someone who appreciates how important mm -hmm. it is, good corporate governance matters. I hate dual-class shareholder companies. They started with media companies. Now they've, they've perverted almost all technology companies. And to be fair, Oddity has dual-class shareholder. I think the brother and the sister who started the company now control it. I hate when you separate ownership from authority. Mm -hmm. The Salzburgers control 2% of the shares of the New York Times, and yet they control the company. Mm -hmm. Are they going to make decisions? Are they great fiduciaries for the other 90% when they, they get to control the company, but they only own 2% of the company? It's important um, when you're on a board to be, you know, occasionally be the, I don't know, the unpopular one. The thing, if you look at Enron, if you look at the boards that have really screwed up here, they all had one thing in common. They got along really yeah. well. They got along really well. And you need, I was at a board meeting this morning, and the companies, like a lot of companies, taking its revenues down by a certain percent and was taking ex its expenses down by, call it, 0.3x of the revenue, uh, a fraction of the revenue decline. And I'm like, those don't foot to each other. And I realize this is painful. I realize you're a young CEO that's never had to create, you know, make a bad decision between bad decisions. Mm -hmm. But when it, as it relates to layoffs, you only want to do it once. So you should go deeper than you want because you don't want to do this twice. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm setting myself up as the hero right now, but your job is to say very uncomfortable things. And at some point, you'd like to think someone on the board said, we shouldn't be sending checks for hundreds of millions of dollars to dad unless we have done a market check on this on a regular basis. Yep. Let's shift over to talking about the debt, because the market really liked the restructuring of this debt, because it basically just decreased the chances of bankruptcy. But... The thing that I'm thinking is like it's not as if it's eliminated the debt. It's just repackaging the debt in the form of higher interest rate payments at a later date, which basically means that Carvana has a few years to figure out a viable business model. Um, but it still has to figure it out. And then you look at the business and used car prices are down 14% in 2022. It's expected to fall another 4% this year. And people are freaking out. It feels, the market's freaking out, it feels like, over this debt restructuring. My question is, is something like this really all that good news for Carvana? Have you ever been involved or tangentially involved with a debt restructuring deal like this? And what's so great about it? Well, restructuring is not only sometimes reducing the debt in exchange for equity, but what it does is it gives the company, it takes the gun away from their head. Yeah. It, it uncocks the gun. Because if you look at a company like Discovery Warner Brothers, it has too much debt. Mm -hmm. But the maturities are way out. So they sort of have two or three years to figure it out, to either sell stuff or cut expenses, whatever it might be, or improve you know, profits. So it does matter. Them, them you know, taking the wolf at the door and chasing the wolf away for a few mm -hmm. years, I mean, the wolf will be back, to your point, and it might be, you know, it might be meaner and angry and hungrier. Yeah. But it's going to go away for a couple of years. So restructuring and removing the imminent threat of some sort of um, covenant, blowing a covenant or something like that, or missing a debt payment, is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I can see why the stock uh, is rallied there. But I mean, just going back to corporate governance, Carvana touts its adjusted EBITDA metric. Whenever you hear the term adjusted EBITDA, watch yep. out. 
watch out because they're going to adjust it in weird ways. They're going to do a bunch of Houdini and jazz hands that make the numbers basically bullshit mm-hmm. just so they can afford like I remember my favorite was a community adjusted EBITDA at WeWork where they took the cost of the real estate they were renting to then lease out desks and they subtracted that from costs. I mean, it's like, you know, uh, profits before everything. I mean, they might as well have just like adjusted EBITDA. It was just so ridiculous. That's when we hit peak craziness. So whenever I hear the terms adjusted EBITDA, I get very, very queasy. And the governance and the reporting requirements in the United States have real benefits. The forward PE of U.S. stocks right now traded about 20, or their average is 20. In Japan, it's 14. In emerging markets, it's 12. In Europe, it's 12. Because people trust that the market and analysts here, and quite frankly, programs like this one will say, okay, adjusted EBITDA is bullshit. Watch out. Look out below. You know, we'll see. I haven't looked at the valuation here. It's been an interesting story. Um, But governance matters. And um, diversity matters. I, I get off. I, I was on the board. I don't think I'm speaking out of school. I was on the board of Panera, and they're shaping up to go public. It's a fantastic company. It's growing. It's profitable. Strong brands, well managed. And it's important that there's a certain level of diversity on a board. Not only because it's the right thing to do, uh, you know, ethically to represent your customer base, represent your employees, represent the community, but a diversity of backgrounds. It prevents you from all barking up the same tree. When you all have the same experiences in terms of life and business, you all kind of engage very easily in groupthink. And as Jonathan Haidt says, when you all bark up the same tree, you get stupid. And so even if you don't think diversity is a key component of equity on boards, it's generally a smart idea just to have a diversity of viewpoints on a board. And so what I did, and I was happy to do it, was I make a room more diverse by leaving it. And so I said, as we move towards an IPO, we're probably going to want to have someone who has a different background than me and, quite frankly, looks, smells, and feels different than me. I'm ready. I can leave the board. And, um, and I did that. Uh, uh, so anyways, I think diverse, uh, diverse boards uh, that take their role really seriously and aren't afraid to push back on the CEO and really question that this is how you know a board member is really doing his or her job. Mm-hmm. They read the board deck, they have their calculator out, they're asking a shit ton of questions, and they're pushing back on, well, what do we mean by adjusted EBITDA? When are we running out of money? Wait, our revenue's off 40%, but we're cutting costs 10%. Shouldn't we be cutting 40% or more? These are the kinds of uncomfortable conversations you need to have in board meetings. Oh, my God. Word salad. (laughs) Word salad. Let's move on to our second story. Microsoft made two big announcements last week. First was a partnership with Meta. Microsoft's cloud computing platform Azure will start hosting Meta's new AI model called Llama 2. Like OpenAI's GPT-4, Llama 2 is a large language model that allows developers to train and build their own AI products. The model will be available on other platforms like AWS and Hugging Face, but Meta has announced that Azure is its preferred partner. Microsoft's second announcement was the pricing of its new AI tool, Microsoft's 365 Copilot, As a part of Microsoft's productivity software, Copilot can summarize your emails or turn a Word doc into a PowerPoint presentation. Now, it won't be available to consumers at launch, but business customers paying for Microsoft 365 will have access to Copilot for an extra $30 per user per month. After that announcement, Microsoft rose 4%, reaching an all-time high and adding $154 billion in market value in just one year day. Scott, your thoughts? Satya Nadella is arguably the most successful venture capitalist in history. Yeah. So Satya made a $1 billion investment and then a $10 billion. Greatest VC investment arguably in history, maybe with the exception of Jack Ma investing, I think it was $50 million at Alibaba yeah. and it turned out being 20 or $30 billion. Anyway, uh, this is uh, extraordinary. And what I would say is that in this circles back to the rider strike, Fran Drescher should be picketing outside of Redmond, Washington, not outside of Netflix or Paramount Studios. You you got to get to the biggest pile of money. All the money being made here, where where does AI get? What is the coal? What is the grist that goes into these LLMs? Mm-hmm. Other people's content, mm-hmm. and there is no way that these models aren't aren't scanning, digesting, and learning from a massive amount of content 
that these studios and these artists and these writers, uh, even, you know, images um, have been informed by makeup artists. I think that is absolutely the pile of money they need to be going after here. Think about this. Microsoft added the value of essentially Disney in one day. It added the value almost of Netflix. If you take out Disney and Netflix, Microsoft in one day added all of Hollywood, yep. all of it and more. And so if they're benefiting, which I believe they are, from the incredible content, that's their focus. That should be their focus. They should join hands with Ted Sarandos. They should join arms with Ted Sarandos and Bob Iger, and they should march towards Redmond. Mm -hmm. That is the enemy here. That is the enemy. And so I remember I consulted or coached or advised, whatever you want to call it, Nike, Adidas, and Under Armour. And they'd all want to talk about gaining advantage against one another. I'm like, come on, you're competitors, but your enemy is also in Seattle, and it's called Amazon. Mm -hmm. And you should be presenting a united front against Amazon, not, not going after each other. Yep. Anyways, the, the numbers here are staggering. They're just staggering. When you, think about, when you think about where the money is, where the value is to be extracted, uh, it's, from, it's from technology. It's not from the studios. Yeah. I think the WGA, the SGA, uh, SAG-AFTRA, and all the studios should have their own technologists right now yep. finding the millions and billions of instances where this LLM, yep. where this generative AI tool, clearly was informed by the content and creativity of their members and their product. And they would claim, oh, it's fair use, or it's already out in the public domain. And I would hire the biggest, scariest lawyers in the world. I would start giving money to every politician and say, you have big tech eating our lunch, mm -hmm. taking our lunch, borrowing our watch, and then telling us what time it is. <laughs> and they need to stop. And I would be filing suits, and I would then come to some sort of accommodation with the deepest pocket in the world, and that is technology, and say, if you want to continue to crawl our content to inform your LLMs, which you are doing millions, if not billions of times a day, we have to come to some sort of agreement where if you can increase your, the value of your company by $154 billion in a day, we, the studios, and the creators, and the actors, and the makeup artists, and the gaffers, and the writers get to share in that. Because for Microsoft to give up, for, for Microsoft, Meta, uh, uh, OpenAI to give up a tiny portion of the incremental revenues and value they're gonna create is much greater then, quite frankly, you know, uh, taking you know, taking it hard to Bob Iger and David Zaslav, they're more, they're riper or more popular targets because it's easier to understand. But if they want to be effective versus right, and that's something I've struggled with my whole life. Okay, they're right to complain about these studio heads making too much money. But okay, the top ten actors make too much money too. You need to go after where your content is creating the most value such that you can extract some of that value. And by far, if you get a tiny slice of the value that tech is going to create off of your sweat and your creativity, you are going to end up in a much better place than if, you imagine, than if, you're, than if you're able to extract a, a pound of flesh from the studios. You're in this together. You have picked the wrong enemy. You are Native American tribes warring against each other when the real enemy is the British or whoever it was who came in and performed, or Americans actually, genocide on Native Americans. You are fighting the wrong enemy. You're allies in this fight. You want to go after the deepest pocket in history, and that is the technology that is leveraging generative AI who is crawling your content. This is your Google moment where I fucked up and the board of the New York Times fucked up. We were so enamored with Google that we let them crawl our data, and they gave us a nickel for every dollar they generated off of our journalism. Don't make that mistake again. This is that moment here and now. It feels like the path that you're going down is sort of the data property rights path. And, you know, there have been a lot of legislative proposals in the past. The, the first one that comes to mind is the data dividend, which is the notion that tech companies use our data to train their models and to train their algorithms. And that's quote unquote our sweat that they're profiting off of and therefore we should get a slice of it as just general content creators do you would you take it that far do you think that that's where we're headed 
Well, the kind of the model here is in Australia. The Australian government said Facebook is where people are getting their news, but the people actually collecting the news and spending money on it and risking their lives sometimes to collect this news aren't getting compensated. Yeah. So they passed a law and said, okay, Meta, you've got to give a portion of your revenues generated in Australia back to journalists. And they're now, and they huffed and puffed and threatened to leave Australia. Same thing's kind of going on in Canada right now. And they ended up paying them $150 million a year. Mm-hmm. And this is good for business. It's good for society because we need more journalists. And I think something, something similar should happen here. I don't know if it should be regulation. I'd like to think we can accomplish a private market solution through the right to assemble and the right to organize, which unions have. But, I mean, there's this giant sucking sound of relevance and capital from Hollywood to the Valley right now. Mm-hmm. And they need to get in the way of that airflow instead of warring with each other. But there's absolutely – if your stock goes up $154 billion in one day because you announced a subscription AI model, and you're informing that model – a little bit of that goes a long way towards paying your writers and your makeup artists. Going back. To- Let me run the union. <laughs> Look for the union dog label. I'm ready. Learn from my mistakes. <laughs> right off, you drag them in a blog post. Uh, going back yeah. to the AI models themselves. And I want to guess. All I want is a guest appearance on The Real Housewives. <laughs> I want to be the, the pervy neighbor. Play. Yeah. The pervy there. God, that guy creeps me out. Oh, yeah, that's Professor G. <laughs> it could happen. <laughs> well, let's talk about Llama 2, which is Facebook's AI model. It's basically a competitor to GPT-4. And the thing that we were finding interesting is the fact that Microsoft is a huge investor in OpenAI, which creates GPT-4. And yet here they are entering a partnership to promote a product that's ultimately going to compete with one of their main investments. Um, Why are they doing that? I think Microsoft sees Meta as the swing vote, and that is, I think they see their enemy is Alphabet, Mm -hmm. and that Meta, with all of their power and consumer engagement with three billion people, has probably said, my guess is, so they partnered on the headset or or the metaverse. Uh, Microsoft has said, we'll develop software for uh, the metaverse. And my guess is they they like and trust each other. And Microsoft is saying, okay, the battle of the, you know, the war of the worlds here is shaping up, to, and AI is shaping up to be between uh, Microsoft and between uh, Alphabet. Mm-hmm. And so they're, they're probably willing to give up some upside and get meta on their side. Yeah. So to me, it's just pick your dance partner. You know, we didn't in World War II, we weren't especially fond of the Russians, mm-hmm. but we had a shared enemy. Yep. And so we were willing to make accommodations and kind of put, you know, let the past be the past, if you will. And I think that's what's going on here. I think that Microsoft and Meta, you know, that is definitely Batman and Robin and chocolate and peanut butter. So, and my guess is Llama is probably approaching it from a different a different angle, but you know, I think they've figured out a way to say, okay, the incremental power we have as a team is worth some of the reduction in economics. Mm-hmm. And then finally, let's just talk about Satya Nadella. So shares have risen a thousand percent since his first day on the job. Uh, he took over at this sort of big inflection point for Microsoft, and he took over from Steve Ballmer, who was seen by many as a failed CEO. He was behind on hardware products. He was way behind on mobile. Um, and then you mentioned the OpenAI investment, which could be one of the greatest corporate investments ever. And the stock is up 50% this year. Um, is Satya the second greatest non-founder CEO in history behind Tim Cook? Is he the greatest? Oh, he's right up there. I mean, first ballot Hall of Fame. Also, peop- a lot of people, analysts, will say it's a little bit unfair that Bomber doesn't get enough credit, yeah. that a lot of the things that Bomber put in place... Uh, Satya took advantage of and and registered, you know, the markets were kind of unkind, but there's just no getting around it. Uh, Satya Nadella is a billionaire and he deserves to be. And he's brought one of the things that not only from a business performance, but from a business image standpoint, Microsoft has all of a sudden gone from Darth Vader back to Anakin Skywalker. Yeah. Microsoft in the 90s, you know, when you were, I don't know, I forget, not born, <laughs> but Microsoft was literally was the mendacious fuck of tech mm-hmm. 
everybody hated them. They were bundling products. They would announce products. They had no intention of launching just to, just to screw with smaller companies such that no one would buy their product because they'd claim they were coming out with a competitive product. Mm -hmm. And people couldn't stand Microsoft and were rooting against them. And they have done a 180. They're now seen as good partners. I, I just don't... I mean, back to the notion of why Meta would partner with Microsoft, not only would Microsoft partner with Meta, because the industry looks at Microsoft now and Satya Nadella as the good guys yes. and good partners. So the cultural shift, um, the fact that they miss search, they miss social, they miss mobile, and they still uh, are the second most valuable company in the world. I mean, yeah, this is... I always thought that um, Reed Hastings was the most underappreciated CEO based on what he had pulled off, the guy, kind of the world's greatest business pivot from mailing DVDs to streaming. But uh, Satya Nadella, he gets a lot, of, a lot of credit and a lot of discussion, but probably not enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. This guy, he's right, you know, he and Tim Cook, what do they have in common? They both come across as humble people. Yeah. They're both measured. They seem to listen a lot. Uh, they both have a certain, I don't know, they, you just get the sense, like, if you could pick a godfather for your child and someone said, hey, oh, how about Tim Cook or Satya Nadella? You'd probably think, yeah, that, that I would trust that person with my child's yeah. life. So would you say the same thing about Elon Musk? Would you say the same thing about Mark Zuckerberg? Not at yeah. all. So character and your the perception of your character and the culture at the company all really matter. But again... Uh, probably the best corporate venture investment in history, maybe with the exception of Jack Ma investing in Alibaba, was Satya Nadella and Microsoft's visionary, early, huge investment in OpenAI. The company is firing on all 12,000 cylinders. Everybody talk, everyone talks about IBM's comeback. Microsoft, over the last 30, Microsoft and Apple are really the Genghis and Khan of tech excellence over the last three decades. So yeah, I, we, we talk a lot about income inequality. Satya Nadella deserves to be a billionaire. So the reason that the stock popped was actually not because of the Llama 2 partnership, but it was because of that co-pilot price announcement, $30 per user per month for businesses. Do you think $30 is a reasonable price? Do you think businesses are going to pay for it? We had a discussion about this off mic. Uh, a bunch of folks at Prof G thought it was too expensive. And I thought, the enterprise will absolutely sign everybody up for this if it makes them more productive. So I saw it as reasonable. I'm terrible at pricing. Yeah. Um, I, and I think pricing is one of the hardest things in business. The hardest thing in management is compensation, and the hardest thing in a consumer business is pricing, in my view. Mm -hmm. But so we were sort of split on it. I thought that an enterprise would absolutely sign up another $30 a month for their information workers thinking if it, they thought it would make them more productive. Uh, but some of the folks thought that was a lot of money. So anyway, the bottom line is we don't know. Mm -hmm. Would you ever want to pay for that for our business? I mean, just taking a, a couple of those features, for example, taking a document, put it through the copilot, and it turns it into a deck. Is that something you'd mm -hmm. be interested for us? Uh, it's a productivity tool I'd be willing to invest in. But first, I would ask the people not spend all their fucking time in Mykonos, <laughs> Ed. <laughs> Oh, that was good. <laughs> Let's take a look at the week ahead. We'll hear from Jerome Powell about the Federal Reserve's next interest rate hike decision. And then we've also got earnings from Microsoft, from Google, Meta, Amazon, Spotify, and Snap. Do you have any predictions for us? I like what you said, Ed. I think this district court ruling has been vastly inflated in terms of its importance. Yep. Um, you know, Jason is a great legal mind, and he seems to think that there's a good chance it'll be overturned. And you're going to see the stocks of Coinbase and the price of Ripple, uh, you know, drop as fast as they surge. Yep. So um, I love that prediction because it involves domain expertise of someone who actually knows what they're talking about, <laughs> Jason. And the fact – so I think it's kind of fun to think this thing probably will get swatted away and people are going to – you know, these, these, these companies are going to revert to their um, – to a much lower price point. Your thoughts, Ed? 100% agree. I mean, I see this going two ways. Either the Court of Appeals will reverse the decision or mm -hmm. they won't. And then the SEC will pursue another lawsuit somewhere else. And a, another another court circuit will reach a different decision. Mm -hmm. um, Most of, but, but, but hold on. More importantly, yeah. I mean, this is really important. Do you need a couple pickup lines for Mykonos? <laughs> 
All right, okay. I, uh, no problem. I will. I will because I want to help you out. Okay, so you, you see a lovely lady, yeah. go up and you say the following. You say the following. Do you believe in love and first sight or should I walk by again? <laughs> Boom! And if that doesn't work, the I number two, the plan B. <laughs> okay, let's go to plan B. Plan B. How about breakfast? Should I call you or nudge you? <laughs> Hello, ladies. Hello. I'm going to film that. I'm going to do that and film it on tape and see what happens. That would be funny. You should yeah. absolutely do yeah. that. Thank you for watching this version of Prop G Markets. Check out our pod feed for office hours on Wednesday, and we'll be back with a fresh take on markets every Monday.